All right, here we go. Another person of passion. Hello. Hello. I'm Ivan. Hi, I'm Milani. Milani. Nice to meet you, Ivan. You too. Welcome to Munden's Cottages. All right. <laughs> <laughs> There's more than cottages though, right? Yes, we have a Cleveland Beach Cottage right there by Cleveland Cleveland Beach. Okay. And is this is this Okay. So is this a rental? Yes, it's an Airbnb. Okay. And then um, we have the bunkie here, which you also rent, um, but it's not winterized. Okay. So uh, there is heat, but you know, we can't really have it if it's minus 20. <laughs> and then soon this will be a rental as well. So this whole compound will be rentals. Where will you be? We'll be over there by Puddle Hill. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> so what all do you do? So I am a multidisciplinary artist and... Which means? Which means I work with my hands. Yes. Uh, I work with organic things. So basically I love to take photos and then I've made them into carpet. Uh, yes, I'll show you some carpet. <laughs> and uh, so then I, I started paintings because people said, oh, we really like your paintings and we'll make them into rugs. So we started selling them across Canada and North America and the U.S. and uh, abroad in, in Asia for hospitality. Wow. And then we moved here, Nova Scotia, beautiful uh, Queensland and I thought what am I gonna do my background is fashion design and so I started uh, designing again because that was my background fashion design and uh, then just recently uh, September 11th <laughs> we were in New York we were asked to show our creations in New York Wow! so yeah but the year before that, I was able to also apply for a grant for a film. So now I'm, I can call myself <laughs> a writer and director. <laughs> and we filmed it, filmed it here in Hubbard's. Yeah? Yeah. So are we going to see any of the things you do? Sure. All right. As you can see, oh I my. haven't packed yet. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> so this is all our luggage. I had many more luggages from New York. So Are you we serious? Yeah. <laughs> so we brought them because we had 17 models from Nova Scotia that we brought to New York. Yeah, so what's, so, what's this? So this is a uh, Musa fabric. So this fabric is made of banana fibers. What? Yes. Who makes it? <laughs> so the indigenous people uh, in the Philippines wow. make it by hand. They weave it. And now uh, the incarcerated women and men in the Philippines in the prison are also weaving it now. So we're supporting them because there's no way for them to support their families. And this is how they do it. And so designers like me from Canada, the U.S., all over the world support this fabric designer. And then we brought it here and then I made a sculptural thing with it. And I named the collection Dagat. Dagat means ocean. Um, I'm, I'm, I love the ocean. We live by the ocean. And basically the, the sculptural element of the clothing it's basically something that you would see in this in the ocean, like seaweed, okay, yes, mollusks, yes. and even here you can see oh, I yes, put seaweed. Real seaweed. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So this is just one of the creations that I've done. Um, I'm also a diver. So what? We, yeah. So we dive under the ocean, and so basically, um, I love seeing all the the canyons and the caverns. And so basically the inspiration comes from the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a huge story behind it because um, as we know, there's climate change. Yes. And the Philippines, um, actually seven years ago, 
I was in the Philippines and we had a major typhoon. A cyclone hit this island where I was staying and uh, they were without power for six months. What? Yes. So it was, it really affected me. As you can see, I haven't been home for seven years. I sold my house in the Philippines. Uh, I was really deathly afraid for my life. I thought I would never see my family again. And so I said, you know, uh, we really do need to respect the environment, respect um, the ocean. And so everything really what I do is sustainable uh, fabric. So it's basically fabric that I have or sustainable fabric like this uh, from the plants, banana plants, um, upcycled clothing. Uh, so I try to have the, I reuse the materials that I've thrifted or we've used uh, in the past. So uh, basically that's my story. I just mm. love um, the environment and I feel like really the show uh, in New York Fashion Week really showed uh, the story of climate change. I had a dancer from Nova Scotia here dance, um, performed a dance about the the beautiful uh, wind and water and waves so it's very ethereal and calm and then all my models came and the designs got darker and darker to black and in the end another dancer from Nova Scotia uh, portrayed the storm wow. and she danced uh, beautifully I mean they were they both did so well Is so that recorded? That's all on video. We so. can see it? Yes. Can I'll send you the video. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so can you dye this? Yes, you can dye it. Uh, you can paint it uh, because it is raw. Um, like, see here, they put two raw patterns the and they've dyed it a little bit here. Um, this one is the raw material okay. and this one has a little bit of organic dye. And it, and it holds up? And it does hold up, yes, because it is natural. So like cotton, it would uh, um, absorb all the dye. Wow. Yeah. Why aren't they making more clothing with that? It's uh, it's very hard to work with. Okay. Um, and of course, it is also coming from the Philippines. And it's usually used to make accessories like hats oh. and bags and mats not usually for clothing but now they're starting to find ways to weave it properly um, that it can be woven with cotton or silk and it becomes more malleable not so stiff like this because it's quite hard and itchy to wear <laughs> <laughs> oh, <itchy. Ooh. laughs> yeah is there anything else you do with fabrics so um my husband and I uh, were agents for flooring, yes. so it's called interiorservices.ca and we're wholesalers for uh, flooring stores and designers and architects across Canada. Wow. So because I do have the fashion design background, my husband said, you know, why don't you design these rugs because design is design. So I said, okay. So I started painting and then from the paintings I did like abstract. I would take uh, little swatches of it, take photos, and then I would do renderings, and then we would send it to an architect designer, and they would say, yes, we want that photo, but only this part uh, enlarged. And then, you know, then they said, oh, we only want gray colors. So, <laughs> so basically that's why these colors are muted here, because these are, um, popular colors uh, for a client because they don't want something that's loud. They want something muted and something that would go with their accessories, their chandelier or things like that. So these are your paintings originally? Yeah. So this is actually a, ph a photographer, uh, photography, sorry. Oh, okay. So these are buildings here. Actually, this partic particular photo is my nephew. This is uh, buildings downtown Vancouver. And then I took his simple photograph of buildings 
and I digitally rendered it. Wow. So I put it in the computer software and then I super, superimposed it like four times and then I changed the coloring and then uh, this is just one piece of the rug. So basically this is the whole rug and this is just the side of the rug you see here. And how is this rug made? So this is made in Kathmandu, Nepal and we support 70 uh, villages, 70 families, sorry, in a village and they are artists and artisans and they weave this a hundred knots per square inch. Knots? Knots. So they knot it by hand. They have they have it in a huge loom and uh, it's made by hand. <laughs> so it's knotted by hand. <laughs> Yes, oh, so it does months and months, oh, sometimes dear. years. It depends on how big you want it. So actually, the Lord Nelson uh, ordered one from me, and uh, we did the whole lobby. Um, this was when we first arrived, but because uh, they wanted colors that were beige, even though I told them you can't have beige in the lobby, because obviously it's muddy, it's wet, <laughs> but they don't listen to you. So anyway, these are the colors they wanted and they it got ruined very quickly. I think it only lasted like, I don't know, five, five six years. Yeah. But we, we partner with uh, a lot of developers downtown. I can't really name them, okay. uh, but uh, we do the hallways, carpeting, bedrooms, and you know all the big names downtown if they want a carpet made we make it for them <laughs> and these aren't cheap so basically uh, uh, yeah. yeah so <laughs> we pay our tradespeople very fairly uh so uh per square foot is a hundred and eighty dollars up to 180 sometimes 250 so this is wool and silk but if it's all silk it's more expensive if it's linen and silk it's very expensive so wool is very durable and a lot of people use wool only uh, without the silk but I like the silk because it adds the sheen and it adds depth to the fabric so this is actually a painting I did but it wasn't gray. The painting was orange. <laughs> and because the, the clients wanted a muted color, we just use all the gray colors. Mm -hmm. This is actually quite popular. It's been sold um, in Asia a few times. Yeah. Amazing. So basically they can pay uh, up to $50,000 for a rug, for an eight by 10 rug. Mm -hmm. It just depends on what they want. I don't get all that. Well, I just want to let you know. I only get paid for my, right. you know, the rendering. Right. Right. Usually Richard takes all the money. Because <laughs> we got to ship it. You yes. know, we got to store it. And, of course, you know, we have to pay for right. the materials. So, if you see, there's well, sheen. Why don't you uh, turn around so I can see the color, the lighting. There, that's it. Okay. So, so tell me about this one. So this one is actually, my God, a part of, of, this is a photography that I did. I was just taking random photos of nature. And one of the clients said, why don't you do a series of that? So we did a series of this in different purples because they wanted a mauve or lilac color, um, which was only sold to them, but because we had samples we were able to keep it as samples for our flooring stores. Wow. But the whole thing looks like this. Wow. So the purple ones is nicer, of course, because it has different types of purples. Right. And different greens. The greens are very popular as well. But, you know, just like fashion, rugs, it, there's a trend in the rugs. Yes. Um, you know, every seven or eight years it changes the trends I know. <laughs> yeah so because i am from the philippines i immigrated here in canada in 86 i have a lot of family in the philippines um 
most of my family actually are still in the Philippines. And so we were able to procure abaca. So abaca is also a type of banana plant, just like the... Well, is this, yes. is this the, what part of the plant do you use? So the stem. So these ones actually grow a different type of fruit. It's not something that we eat. Uh, it's something, it's very seedy and uh, it's not something that we consume. You mean bananas? The banana. There's bananas that you don't eat? <laughs> <laughs> well, they've been basically, it's a hybrid, right? The ones that oh. we eat now, we they, they grew naturally in the tropical and then tropical climates. And then they breed them so that it's edible for us today. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so these are some of the colors of rugs. So are they dyed or is that natural? So this one is dyed and these two are natural. Great. Wow. But again, they use um, organic dyes. And how is it made? Uh, again, this is hand woven on a loom, uh, but only one person works on it. Usually a male person will work on it because it's quite labor intensive. Uh, but these ones, women have very tiny, beautiful hands. And mm -hmm. so usually the women uh, make the Nepalese rugs, mm -hmm. um, some, some of the men too. But there could be, you know, five to seven women working on it. But they all have to be uh, usually related because uh, they have the same way of nodding. DNA. Yes. <laughs> wow. Because it's passed down. Isn't They're it? artisans, so you know, they didn't go to school. This was passed down from their ancestors to them. Wow. Yeah. So what else do you do? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, I always believe that, you know, I was the sixth child and I was a menopause baby. They didn't even want me. <laughs> Basically, I was an incubator baby. I was barely seven months and I didn't do well in school. I always wanted to doodle and do art. I couldn't focus. Um, and something I always did was work with my hands. You know, I played with the ants outside. I, you know, I, I went actually was in a boarding school often and my parents were never around. So basically I had to learn how to entertain myself and it was basically doing crafts, jewelry, learning how to paint, doing flowers. Um, so yeah. your paintings? So the paintings are over here. Actually, <laughs> most of the paintings are into rugs now and we've either auctioned it off or we sold it uh, for different charities. But I only paint um, I don't paint constantly. If there is a commission work, that's when I paint because as you can see, I live in a very tiny place and I don't have a lot of space to paint. So if they, if I, if they ask me to paint, I will do it. <laughs> so let's see your work. <laughs> okay. So what are these? Okay. So these are before I make a final painting. I always like to play around with colors. So okay. I always think, okay, well, what colors do I have left? Um, usually they'll say, oh, I want it to match my chandelier or something. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is horrible. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you got to do it because it pays the bills. So then I start to, I just start with, uh, actually, this is um, foam. foam. Foam core. Oh, yes. Yes, because it was something that was left behind from this house that was when we bought the house. It was leftovers, and I didn't want to throw it out. We couldn't use it. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to throw paint on it. <laughs> so then I just started, yeah. Question? <laughs> what do you like better? I really like acrylics better. I still do watercolors if I wanted to. Um, maybe start in a little swatch first and see how my colors would uh, be together. Like I heard that you like water on water. I love that too. Yeah, yeah. But I noticed that you could do that as well with acrylic. Yes. So I love that. How um, did you know I painted? 
<laughs> I saw your video. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you were sneaking. <laughs> yes. So you said yeah. these are your rejects? These are the rejects um, that did they didn't pick. So they, the office in Bears Lake chose um, oh. more uh, darker colors. So we don't have, we can't see them. You can see them in Bears Lake in the yeah, office. I think, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have photos somewhere. Okay. Yes, yeah. And like I experiment with um, digital art. So like I said, I ha I do rendering. So this is a photograph of my niece and I basically enhanced it in a software that I use for rugs. So then I made this. It's a rug? Yeah. I didn't have enough room. Don't take that part. That's all right. <laughs> all right. So this yeah. photograph is in manipulation. Yes. So what else is this one behind? So this, these are just rejects. These are just painting around and seeing what colors I had left. Um, some of them are finished. Some of them are not. Ooh. My yes. So my mother-in-law liked this kind of yes. painting, Renaissance. And I haven't finished it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and what about on the chair? What and then these? these are abstract that these are also rejects. There's the town clock. <laughs> That's the town clock. Right? Yes. Right there. Well, where are the ones that aren't rejects? They're all sold. What? Uh, they're <laughs> The rejects are sold. So we <laughs> I can send you uh, images. links mm -hmm. yeah, and images. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I understand you do something about weddings. What is it? Yeah, so we own Nautical Nuptial South Shore. So we do, because we do own Cleveland Beach Cottage, we have the honeymooners stay there. We do events. So one of the events that we do is wedding planning. Um, I don't call myself a wedding planner, but I call myself a wedding stylist because I basically um, set the design for the wedding, the decorations, the flowers. Um, I do everything but actually perform the wedding. <laughs> um, sometimes I do videos and sometimes I do the photography, but usually because I have my hands full, I need to make a an experience and create an experience for them. Um, I always hire a videographer and a photographer for them. Also, we do uh, the catering as well, so I hire a chef to come in and cater the wedding. So they, they love this location because everybody wants to have a beach wedding. Yeah. Even though we can't technically perform the wedding here on the beach, um, we do perform it there, but all the photographs are done here on the beach. Well, what's the yeah. scoop about not doing a wedding on a beach? <laughs> There's a lot of things that you can't do on the beach. What's wrong with that? <laughs> this is the provincial park. You can't even have a, a bonfire here, but people do it. Oh, but if it was a yes. private beach, you could do it. If it was a private beach, you could do it, yes. This is a beautiful location. Though. Yes. You need to have a permit for all these provincial parks, so. Okay. Yeah. I also, because I've started doing uh, film, people have known me to do uh, set design. So I also draw designs for sets for a documentary. I've done a couple in the winter time. So hopefully I'll be able to do it again this winter time. But I was able to do uh, an antique roadshow type design, uh, set design, and also did uh, Militaria. Wow. <laughs> what else do you do? So this is um, my first film, my first short film, and it was uh, actually filmed here at Anchorage House in Hubbard's. Wow. Yeah. Did you write the script? I wrote and directed it, and basically, I, you know, I called all my friends and said, can you guys help me with catering, with the food savory plate? <laughs> the catering some of my friends did the catering um, so this is a grant that you apply for um, and then we got a grant for 
uh, $35,000 mm. to make a film. Wow. Yes. So it, you know. How do we get to see it? It's, I can send you the link if you want. Yes, of course yes. we will. It was on, it was, it was on Finn last year, the Atlantic International Film Festival. It won five awards around wow. the world and showed in 16 festivals. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so is this, is this more of it? Then that's me. <laughs> at Anchorage House directing. Oh, mask time. Yes, this is during COVID. Yeah. yeah. So and what, what took you down that path? So just like, you know, painting and art, you know, this is a form of storytelling. Yes. So again, it's another creative part that I always wanted to do. I always had a camera. I always documented my life because... Uh, like I said, I was a sixth child. I only have a few photographs of myself. And I said, you know, when I have children, I'm going to document their life. So I've always <laughs> done it. And I would like, I wanted, I started doing travel vlogs and things like that on Instagram. And uh, one day during the pandemic, a friend of mine said, there is... You know, I know you're not working right now. You're not doing anything creative. Do you want to, you know, uh, attend Atlantic Film Co-op? And I said, okay, sure. So I took one workshop. It was an intensive film workshop. Um, so we got to film a one-minute film. And that actually showed in Oregon's um, hall at the Halifax Library. And then from there, uh, you know, then I took more classes. People really liked the film. And I said, well, maybe I'm good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so then I applied. I had 10 days to apply because I didn't want to. I was scared. I didn't really want to put out a story about myself. I actually feel really emotional because... It's about my family. So um, just talking about immigrating and being isolated, I think I needed to really talk about it. And because of the pandemic, we couldn't see people. I really felt the isolation. And uh, I remember my mentor saying, in like 10 days, you know, you should write it. And I said, how can I write a script in 10 days? Mm -hmm. So... I was actually cleaning the cottage because I'm the cleaner at the cottage. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't trust anybody else to clean it. So then I was cleaning the toilet. And then this flashback of my mother's diary. <laughs> when she passed away, she left this diary. And I didn't know she was writing. And then uh, I happened to acquire the diary and she talked about, you know, coming from the Philippines, she was quite an entrepreneur. She had procured lands, coffee fields, rice fields. Um, so she was quite a proud woman and to come here and to be cleaning toilets. I think it really broke her heart. And I remember she, she told the story of like she was cleaning the toilet and she she almost wanted to go to the top of the floor and jump mm -hmm. because she couldn't handle the the people talking down to her and she's like here I am, you know, cleaning toilets. But on top of that, people talked to me like I was a slave. You know, I was a servant. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it really broke her spirit. And then she said at the end, she's like, I can't do it. You know, I have to take care of myself. I have to think of myself because I still have the little one to take care of, which was me. And I didn't really have a, a really great relationship with my mother because, you know, coming here... And she's quite religious. She's quite um, strict. Um, 
I was it was I was very limited in what I had to do. I had to act a certain way, and uh, unlike now, <laughs> so now I I I feel like now you're this, rebelling. Yes. <laughs> so actually, she she passed away ten years ago, and that's how we ended up living here. Um, I did we did I did immigrate here in Nova Scotia, but my husband and I left for 15 years and uh, or more actually 17 years and uh, when my mother passed on I said let's go back home to Nova Scotia I just can't I need to take care of myself I need to take care of the kids and settle down I couldn't handle having a corporate job I couldn't you know I just couldn't keep up with the demands of life and we all know how expensive it is in Vancouver. I said, I, you know, you go do your thing because we still had our flooring business in Vancouver. Um, so anyways, yeah. So that's why I ended up here in Nova Scotia and by the ocean because I really needed to heal. And I'm so glad I got to tell the story and I hope you guys get to mm -hmm. see it. Oh, so what is the story? So the story is about this girl, Lena. Um, she is a migrant worker from the Philippines. Um, we have a different story from how we immigrated to Canada, but uh, Lena just represents all the, the domestic helpers and the nurses and the migrant workers that come here in Canada. And people don't really realize the isolation that they felt, just like what my mother felt and how we felt during the pandemic. And I think all that emotion, I needed to write it down. And so basically Lena's story is she is 22 and she gets pregnant early. She has to leave her infant son in the Philippines to come here to provide a better life for her son. That's all I'm going to say because oh, I don't want to ruin it. No, no, you don't. want to ruin our appetites. Yes. So it's only a short film. It's only a, a um, kind of a training film. So the next film, I have to do a feature film. So now I'm writing that. You have it in mind? I do have it in mind. It's written, but it still needs to get rewritten a million times before mm. it gets approved. And hopefully I get into another program um, and you get mentored to basically develop the script further. Yes. So in doing all of this, I've actually volunteered with the women uh, in film and television. So uh, WIFT and I've also joined the board of the Atlantic Film Co-op where I learned because I realized um, there is not a lot of uh, BIPOC uh, people, people black and indigenous and people of color in the industry. And so I really uh, wanted to inspire uh, Filipinos and other immigrants to tell their story because it's very, very hard um, to tell your story because you don't want to be ungrateful being mm. in Canada. Uh, you want to show them the struggles, but you don't want to talk about, you know, how, what you went through. But now I think, you know, how we are today, I think people are encouraged to talk about their stories. Because how are we supposed to learn from right, it, right? Exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of that right now. So do you yeah. have any final words? Um, what kind of final words? <laughs> Now that you made me cry, Ivan. <laughs> um, I think just be yourself. Okay. Um, be creative. And it's, to, for me, it's always something gnawing in the back of my head. And I don't know, quite know how to satisfy that itch. And so I need to always work with my hands. I always need to, um, and I think that comes from, my indigenous roots, you know, we're out there in the mountain, we're always hunting and gathering and, um, you know, carving, weaving. I think that's, I embody that. And I think knowing your roots and where you come from, that's very important. So find out where you are, where you come from, because it really, you'll really understand uh, who you're going to be in the future.
great. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>